Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for hopping on this segment of Combine Programming. My name is Matt Foley, and I'm the Program Director of the Combine Incubator. If you are not yet familiar with the Combine, we are a resource for ag tech and food tech companies across the state of Nebraska. Um, we are supported by primarily Invest Nebraska and the Department of Development, and our goal is to support early stage innovators in the food and ag tech space. Today, we are fortunate to have one of our statewide sponsors, Lutz Financial, helping us out with some of our programming. They're going to be talking about financial controls for small teams. Um, but before I pass it over to them, I just want to talk a little bit more about the Combine Incubator and our goal as, a, as our goal as a state. Um, we launched in 2019, and our vision is making Nebraska the best possible state to build an early stage ag tech company. And to do that, it really is a statewide resource. So we have sponsors like, like Lutz and the Nebraska Farm Bureau and the Nebraska Corn Board that all contribute their, their knowledge, their network, their talent, and their expertise to help out early stage startups. Um, and just in the past couple of months, we've had companies that have joined our program, raised capital, and are now hiring employees because we do this through Lens of Economic Development. We're always trying to help the future founders and builders in the state of Nebraska. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over. We have Michael and Will with the Lutz team. And like I mentioned, they're gonna be talking today about financial controls, how it is relevant and helpful to startups in the early stage, but also what we talk about a lot, I'll make you guys host, sorry. What we talk a lot about at the Combine is begin with the end in mind. And that means, what does it mean to have a company that is ultimately able to exit a liquidity event for the founders, a liquidity event for your investors, and preparing for what it means to actually being able to sell a business down the road. And that could be many years down the road, but still what sort of financial controls are needed. So Michael and Will, we appreciate your time. Thanks for taking some time out of your afternoon. And uh, with that, I'll hand it off to you guys. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, I guess for just a quick intro, my name is Will Fry. Uh, I work in our audit department here at Lutz. Um, so I deal mostly with financial reporting uh, for businesses of all sizes. And with that comes a lot of looking at the various processes in the accounting and reporting department at companies. And uh, that's kind of where the financial controls part comes in. Uh, and I'll let Michael introduce himself. Yep, thanks everybody for joining. My name is Michael Gretemann. I'm a CPA, but work more in our you know, valuation, M&A, or mergers and acquisitions group. Kind of handle a variety of projects, um, you know, from startup companies to more mature uh, companies as well. So we're here to kind of help, you know, with any questions you may have, and we've got these topics, but you know, moving forward, we're uh, welcome to any topics that uh, the business owners on the call would uh, find interesting from a, a CPA, financial advisor um, perspective. So uh, here to help. Yeah, uh, so I guess with that, we'll just dive right in. So I will start off with the more financial controls part. Um, for a lot of startups, this is gonna look different than it will for a big publicly traded company that has you know, a fully built out accounting staff and uh, has like a formal documented process and, and matrix is set up to show how it's impossible to commit fraud, right? Like we're working with startups. We have, you know, probably a founder handling the accounting, maybe uh, somebody in the account that, that does the accounting for the founder. So um, smaller teams, we're looking at, at what's going to be practical and really get you set up for success as you grow and, and you know, start raising seed rounds and get into more liquidation type uh, activities. So first and foremost, let's let's figure out why these are important. So if you see that first bullet point, money fights and money problems are listed as a reason for divorce in 40% of marriages. Uh, I mean, this is kind of a little bit of a joke, but don't let money fights and problems break up your business too. And by that, I mean, you know, if you have a co-founder, don't, don't ignore these things until at some point something contentious happens between the co-founders and that's what ends up destroying your startup. Or if you hire an accountant um, and you don't have some things in place to make sure that, that you know that you can trust this person, that can also really do some harm to your business. So there's some easy steps you can take that, that will help kind of prevent things. And then, like I said uh, at the last slide, set yourself up for success. Um, one, if you know you can trust your financial information, you have a lot better business insights into what's going on. And then two, as you get down the road and, and people are looking to invest in your company or maybe you're looking to exit, uh, you start getting into quality of earnings. And if, if, um, if you have shoddy accounting records, 
you may not, uh, you may run into some issues when those things start to come up. Um, so like I said, we're gonna keep it pretty high level. So here's the what, as far as financial controls for small businesses and startups. The, the four I broke it out to here are separation, meaning separation of duties, documentation. Uh, I like to call this like the metadata around your transactions, reconciliation. Um, these are just a few pretty simple monthly accounting type functions you can do to just double check that your records capture everything in your cash that happened in your cash accounts. Uh, and then review is, is kind of like what I said at the front. Um, just just over communicate and keep an eye on what's going on. So if we start with separation, you can see they're sharing is caring. Um, if you have more than one person in your startup, it's, uh, I mean, on the founding team, it, it, I would say it's probably very important to overshare what happens in your business's uh, financial activity. Um, so there's formal separation of duties, which would be, uh, you know, your accounting department will handle the generation of paychecks, for instance, and then, you know, your business owner or somebody with, with custody over the bank account will approve and sign those paychecks. Um, those are good to have if you're fortunate and have, a, and have an accounting staff um, that'll handle those, those functions for you. Uh, it's always good to separate the accounting from the cash custody, uh, so that, you know, one person creates the transactions, another person says, Hey, you know, if, if Michael's, uh, my business owner and I'm his accountant, if he just gives me the checkbook and says, Hey, go ahead, you're, you're handling everything. I could start writing checks to myself and, and call myself a vendor and record it. And depending on how much he, you know, he and I communicate and how hands-on he is in the books, he may not realize it until months down the road. Um, so that, I mean, that's an extreme case, but, uh, that's where that separation of duties comes into play is, um, you want to make sure that you no one person is responsible for all parts of this. Now back to, the audience here. I'm assuming a lot of you are founders um, and maybe a co-founding team. And that's where I'd say the oversharing um, really comes into play. And, and uh, one, one tip I kind of have is like, if you have co-founders, yeah, you, you both want to be able to stay nimble. And, you know, if you got to take a, a potential client out and, and have lunch or something, you don't necessarily need to get approval from each other to spend 20 bucks at Chipotle to buy somebody a meal. But if you're going to go out, if Michael and I are starting a company and I'm going to go out and spend 10 grand of our 20 grand that we've put together to buy uh, some big items that we're going to, you know, use for our company, it's probably a good idea to have some sort of email documentation, something that says, Hey, we both agree that we're going to spend this money in this way for these things. Um, so that kind of covers those first three. The next one is reconciliation. Uh, it's just a good idea if you have more than one person, have one person prepare a reconciliation and another person review it. Again, I go back to the accounting staff and business owner. Your accounting staff or your accountant could prepare that reconciliation and then your business owner could look at it, you know, give a quick scroll of transactions and the outstanding checks and whatnot. And we'll go over rec the cash reconciliation, really reconciliation, but um, just, Again, just keep an eye on things. Uh, a little bit of work now goes a long way in the future. Uh, I hinted towards documentation. Like I said, I call it metadata. Um, as you can see, save your receipts. It's, a, it's just a good idea to have. And, and I, I think QuickBooks is a very popular software. We work with it a lot here. Um, I think it's a great software and it allows you to upload receipts. It's, it's a good idea to have support, as we call it in the audit world, for your transactions. Um, again, I know if you have a ton of small transactions, this is going to be annoying and feel, you know, pretty pedantic. But for those big ones, for things that that you have that you need to have some sort of record of what's going on, why this cash is moving to where it's going, keep those documents. Um, like I said, if you're using QuickBooks, you can upload them and even attach them to each of those transactions. So that's a big, big uh, 
I guess it's not even really technically a financial control, but it's a great best practice so that if, you know, months down the road, Michael and I get into a tip about, hey, where's all our cash going? Well, let's look back at where we're spending it. Well, what did you spend $10,000 on three months ago? Well, now I can hook in and see, oh, here we go. Here's the receipt. This is what it's for. Yeah, we talked about it. And it just avoids a fight, right? Like, if, if we don't have any documentation, that could be a whole thing where now, as co-founders, we're looking at each other, starting to point fingers and blame each other for why our cash is burning up so fast. And, you know, if we have this support, this metadata, um, it, it gives us a lot better view of, okay, maybe as a team, we just need to start sharpening up and, and, and uh, focusing in on our budget. So documentation is a, is a very simple one, but a very um, key one, especially early on. The other side of it is, as you grow, if you do end up hiring an accounting person and your books are, you know, kind of all over the place, if you have a bunch of documentation, they can go back and use that to, to help clean things up and, and get you in a better spot. So great best practice there. Uh, the next one, reconciliation. Um, so this one is big because at the end of the day, your financial records reflect what happened in the real life, right? So it's a great check and balance of, okay, my financial records are supposed to reflect what happened in real life. If my cash account doesn't agree to the cash in my bank account, then, uh-oh, I probably missed a few things. Or if my inventory doesn't agree to the, the, the amount of inventory I can physically count in my warehouse or whatever, then, uh-oh, I probably missed something. So uh, as you can see here, a quick and dirty example of a bank reconciliation. You can Google um, bank reconciliation and do a YouTube and somebody, there, I'm sure there's hundreds of videos of people explaining how to do a, a proper bank rec, but a quick and dirty is you take your bank balance um, at the end of the month, you take your book balance at the end of the month. The difference there, there's usually two big items that account for it. You got uncleared checks. So I write a check on um, December 29th and give it to whoever I'm paying. I record that in my accounting system, but whoever I'm paying doesn't cash it until January. It's not gonna be on my end of the month, December bank statement. Uh, and then the same thing in the opposite direction with deposits and transit. If I receive some cash and send it to the bank uh, right before the end of the month, they don't receive it, process it, and get it on my bank statement until January 1st. So it's, it's not uncommon for your book cash balance to disagree with your bank statement, those are the two uh, first places I would go. And then after that, like I said, YouTube's a great, great resource for, for the details and the nitty gritty of that. Uh, another key one to um, reconcile, so to speak, is inventory. Um, I, I don't know out of the combine companies how many would have like true inventory tracking quite yet. The sense I get, and Matt, maybe you can jump in here, is a lot of these companies are doing like R&D where it's you're buying materials and kind of iterating on your product. Yeah, that that, that, that's a perfect summary. I mean, not, none of the companies watching this will have true inventory in the sense where they're, you know, products come in and out. But as far as the R&D stage, a lot of that, they're still going to want to obviously have a process for categorizing it. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's definitely important to track, and the reason for that in the R and D stage is, um, you know, from a tax side, you can get credits for those R and D expenses, and uh, you know, as you're using those those items to build your robot or or you know whatever you're building, uh, that gets counted in there. Um, so I guess this one's more a thing to keep in mind as you grow. So as you maybe finalize, get your V one dot O product and you start going into production mode, uh, it's important to keep really good inventory tracking, one, for your own financial records so that you know um, what's coming in and out. And again, back to that, where's my cash going thing. But also if you look at kind of the equation on this slide, um, if we look at the way your inventory balance changes, you have your, you know, let's say we're talking about a month again, you have your beginning inventory, everything that goes out is going to go to your cost of goods sold, right? Because that's inventory that you've put together and then you've sold. And then everything that comes in is your new purchases. Um, and that's how you'll get to your end of the period inventory. Now, those three that are in dark blue there, 
those are going to hit your balance sheet. That green one, cost of goods sold, actually runs through your income statement. So I say all this, and it's kind of it's kind of a rigmarole way to get around. Um, your inventory tracking can actually end up affecting your profit and loss statement. And I've done some work on a quality of earnings project where this ended up biting somebody in the butt because they had pretty poor inventory tracking and they um, ended up having to adjust that through their cost of goods sold, which then hits their gross margin. And somebody was coming in to buy the company and said, well, you say you, you earned this, but really, if we look at your inventory, you didn't earn quite that much. So we're not going to pay you as much for your company. So that's just an example of like how these things can really end up costing you dollars um, at the end of the day. Not to scare anybody, just a reason to say, hey, when you get to that phase, keep this in mind to say it might be worth the investment to maybe find a good inventory tracking software or um, just get yourself set up from the beginning right. Uh, finally, review um, is just good practice. And I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of you founders are doing this to review your financial information on a regular basis. Uh, one, to see how your growth is going. Uh, and then also from the perspective of our conversation today, just to see if there's anything weird that ended up going through your financials, right? Like it's, it's not uncommon to smash the keyboard. We call it fat fingering in accounting where we'll see it at full scale companies where you know, they wanted to type in $10,000 for an expense and it ended up being a million dollars because they smashed the zero button a few times. So there's stuff like that, that, you know, you might see one month, oh, my expenses jumped and tripled. Well, it, oh, I just, I just fat fingered a button as I was entering something in a QuickBooks. So it's a good idea to just review it uh, on a regular basis and you can um, keep an eye on things like that. Specific to your business, um, you know, there's, there's going to be financial metrics you want to look at. Um, but in general, you, you know, hit your high level revenue. You're probably going to have some sort of projection or at least an expectation. Hey, if I'm a subscription business, I've sold X number of su subscriptions. I should see my monthly revenue at Y. And if it's not at that number that I expect it to be, I need to look into why, you know, maybe somebody canceled their subscription, something like that. So, um, there's a lot you can learn from reviewing. Uh, and then, like I said, um, review those reconciliations just to keep an eye out and, and make sure things aren't slipping through the cracks. Um, so in, in, in review, uh, our four financial controls for small businesses or things to keep in mind uh, as, you're, as you're setting up accounting for your startup, separation, um, and documentation. I think I can summarize both of these by saying over communicate, right? Share all your, you know, try and capture all your receipts as much metadata you can on your transactions. And then if you are going to spend some, some money on something that's outside of the normal course of business, it's a great idea. And, and this goes back to documentation, but you can, you know, text your accountant or your co founder and say, hey, you know, I'm going to buy this for the company. Are you cool with that? Yes. Take a screenshot of that. And that's documentation of, you know, what happened for that transaction. So um, those two are great. And then reconciliation and review are just, um, yeah, they're a little bit tedious, but a little bit of work goes a long way with those as far as keeping things clean as you continue to grow. Um, so that's, that's my two cents on the financial controls part. And I'll let Michael get into the, uh, the rest. Thanks, Will. And I can't help but uh, comment, I mean, to everything you've said, it reminds me a lot about marriage and your first slide in that. You know, I remember before I got married, we had to meet, you know, with different people and kind of talk about some of these bigger issues that, yeah, sure, they're not a big deal when you first get married, but, you know, 10, 10 20, 30 years down the line, it's helpful to be on the same page. So as I'm sure all the listeners know better than I do, it seems that, you know, the founding you know, management group of a, of a startup company, it's the same exact thing. So you're yeah. going to try to look ahead within reason into how the company is going to, um, you know, grow and what could be an issue later on, as well as just be familiar with what the other person or persons are doing. You know, so say Will's in charge of accounting. I'm not going to overstep and be trying to, you know, pull the strings there, but it's good for me to have the basic understanding of what's all going on, 
um, you know, in case something were to happen down the road. So yeah. um, good inputs there, Will. Thank you. So the second half of this presentation, we wanted to get into a little bit of what I'm saying here in terms of the future. So valuation is kind of a buzzword that, you know, is, is thrown around in, in the VC startup world. Um, and a lot of that has to do with what's known as the 409A valuation. And admittedly, I'm going to state a pretty high level here. Um, I'm not a tax professional. We have people at LUTS that are much more in tune with the actual details of 409A. But basically, once you get to a certain point um, where the company decides to issue options or some other type of stock to key employees or founders, it's important that you stay apprised of the 409A regs from the IRS. So basically, in order to have this be a tax advantageous um, way to compensate your employees when you may not have the money coming in in terms of the cash flow to pay them a salary, um, there's very strict rules about you know, the issuance price um, of the stock options before they can be issued for these uh, tax benefits. So why is it needed, like I said, for the IRS purposes? You have to qualify for the safe harbor. If you don't, there could be pretty strict tax, um, you know, you have to pay taxes on that difference there as well as pretty hefty penalties if you're not within the safe harbor um, required for a 409A valuation. Usually this comes about after, you know, seed capital has been raised. Uh, we've seen it, you know, once the Series A is, is getting to be an, uh, a thing, then that's when you're likely going to want to start thinking about having a 409A valuation done if you plan to issue any options. So what are the steps for this valuation? So you're going to want to work with an independent valuation firm. There's a lot of specialists for this type of work, which we don't do a whole lot of 409A valuation, but we do a whole lot of valuation work in general. So there's firms that specialize in this. You have to give them quite a bit of information, um, projections if available, historical information, et cetera. So then the valuation firm will calculate what's known as an enterprise value, which is basically just the total value of your entity you know, an equity and debt um, perspective. And then kind of comes the hard part where you have to say, okay, well, say the, the enterprise value is $5 million. Well, then how much of that would flow in the case of a liquidation? How much of it would flow to the Series C versus the founder versus the Series A sh shareholders, et cetera? So that's generally why we've seen um, uh, just a few firms across the country really specialize in this is, is that step there is the allocation to the different classes of stock. It gets to be pretty theoretical um, and academic to a degree. So, you know, you probably have to see a specialist at that point if you get to a 409A valuation. So whether it's a 409A valuation or just a valuation in general, I thought it'd be helpful just to touch on how a company is valued in general. So some of you may be familiar with, you know, a real estate appraisal for you know, commercial property or agricultural property. It's kind of the same thing for a business. You know, our general methods fall under three different approaches. So you have your asset approach, which you're basically going to look at the balance sheet of a business and try to, you know, adjust all the tangible and intangible assets and liabilities to their current value. Not seen all that often, uh, except in, you know, holding companies. And you have your market approach, which you're going to reference comparable transactions within your industry. So you determine a multiple and apply that to your company. And the third, which is the most common and, and the most relevant oftentimes is the income approach. You, that approach is just worried about or concerned about measuring the cash flows of the business into the future. So the next few slides, I'll touch on each of these approaches in a little more detail. So like I said, the asset approach, oftentimes it's going to be used with, you know, real estate entities or companies that have a lot of um, assets, so capital intensive industries. So you're going to take your balance sheet, you got your assets and your liabilities and your equity accounts. And there's oftentimes a lot of different accounting implications to, uh, you know, the accrual or cash basis um, balance sheet that are great for accounting, but not necessarily good for um, you know, a fair market value consideration. So if we think about, say, the balance sheet on a, on a uh, tax return, 
likely if you have any fixed assets, you're going to accelerate the depreciation of those assets uh, to claim the tax deductions in an earlier year to minimize your tax liability. So while that's great for tax, all of a sudden the net carrying value of your fixed assets is not very indicative of market value. So you try to figure out, okay, what's your fixed assets worth? What's your inventory worth? Are there any other non-recorded liabilities such as you know, liability contingencies or litigation contingencies, excuse me, or uh, other you know, loans, et cetera. So this is not something that we go too deep in most of the time in our valuation. It's relevant for businesses that are mature businesses with little or no history of cash flows um, where the return on assets is underperforming. And the biggest issue that I see with the startup is it's hard to measure the goodwill or the intangible value of a business when it hasn't translated to a balance sheet yet. So a lot of companies I'm sure that are in the combine, um, you know, there's a lot of intangible value that's built up, but that's not necessarily shown on the balance sheet as of a certain date. And therefore it's difficult to measure that. So this is just a quick example, you know, get your book basis of your balance sheet on the left side here and you know, you're going to adjust the accumulated depreciation to get to a, a more appropriate market value indication for your fixed assets. And just for reference here, I'm throwing on that other intangible assets there. It's an adjustment of $5 million to bring your total assets to 15500000 That $5 million adjustment would be very difficult to make because it's hard to quantify what that adjustment should be. So that's, you know, I'm talking a lot about this, but chances are this will not be something that's used um, much at a startup company, given the, the difficulty in, in quantifying that intangible asset value. So this, sorry, Michael, uh, this like for these guys to me would be like they, they file a patent and lock mm -hmm. something down and then somebody comes in and says, hey, I want I want to buy your company right now before you even have a chance to really develop on this patent, yeah. just because I believe in that patent that would probably be where this might come into play. Yeah, that's a good idea. So maybe, you know, the company thought they had a great idea, they got the patent, but then they haven't been able to, to actually turn that into cash flows. Yeah. Well, then somebody may be willing to swoop up and buy the patent, you know, say it's 750,000, well, they may give you a little bit of a, a sweetener on top of that. Yeah. yeah. So it's gonna okay. be a lot of real estate companies, asset holding companies, whether it's a patent or yeah. you know, equipment, et cetera. So. Pretty straightforward there. The next method, the next approach is the market approach. So there's various, you know, different methods within the market approach. So the first one's the guideline public company method. So this is basically, you're gonna to look to the public markets. So S&P 500 companies, et cetera. So you do your best to find comparable companies to yours um, that are publicly traded, figure out what a multiple that they would have, you know, say it's a price to earnings or price to revenue, and try to back into a value of your company based off that multiple. Secondly, is the guideline transactions method. Similar to the public company method, you're looking at companies within your industry. However, in this method, you're generally going to be looking at private company transactions. So a, a buy sell or a, a transaction or acquisition by a, a either a public or a private company of a private company within your industry. There's certain databases that we subscribe to that can help give you multiples for this uh, method. Again, it's, it's difficult in that, you know, it's hard to find truly comparable transactions within your industry, no matter how many databases you subscribe to, there's gonna be differences in your company uh, to the other companies. So this is a little harder given the, the difficulty in finding the industry data. And third, this bucket's a little bit, uh, you know, there's a few more options under here, but, you know, say somebody offered to buy your stock at, at $10 a share. Well, if it was arm's length and they were, you know, a third party, that could be a decent indication of they think it's $10. So that's kind of what the market thinks. Um, as well as if you issued any stock to your employees or, um, you know, if any of stock was issued to any outsiders, that's something that we'll consider uh, in looking at the market approach. So the second bullet point there, the common valuation metrics. It's common to hear people say, you know, they were sold for five times or 10 times, and it becomes, well, five or 10 times of what? 
oftentimes that'll be you know, one of the first two ratios there on the left, the enterprise value um, over EBITDA. So enterprise value is your, your, the value of your debt and the value of your equity minus your cash. And then the EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So the EBITDA is kind of a proxy for cash flow in that you kind of eliminate some of those items that could go up or down, you know, for instance, the depreciation and amortization maybe um, swing wildly based on the year given, you know, tax depreciation taken, um, as well as how you're financing it with your interest expense and any tax considerations. But I think probably the most common for a startup company would be the enterprise value to sales. So maybe it's two times sales or five times sales, whatever it may be. Once you can back into that, you know, say you got a million dollars of sales to five times revenue multiple, then the value is five million dollars, but you owe your, your bank a million bucks, then the value to you after you get paid the five million dollars is four million dollars because you still have to pay off the bank. Um, so that's just kind of you know a few options here. The ones on the right, the price to book value or the price to earnings, those aren't really used all that often aside from maybe a reasonableness check. Um, but for the startup world, I think the sales multiple um, is pretty prevalent versus the more established company, you're almost always going to be looking at even a multiple because investors at that point care um, a lot about your cash flows rather than just your, your ability to generate sales. Lastly, we've got this rule of thumb on here. So there's all kinds of you know, sources that say, well, if you're engaged in this business, it's a, you know, two to four times revenue. If you're in this business, it's five to six. There's some value there as a sanity check, but you're never really going to rely upon that for a true transaction. And this slide here, I'm just showing some different, this is a database that we subscribe to. So this list, you know, the industry, um, you know, the type of target or the company that was acquired, when it happened, and then various metrics from a sales and EBITDA perspective that ultimately drive, you know, the median or a range of multiples on the bottom there. So I can't remember what industry this is with the NAICS code, but uh, you know, you're looking at a, a median uh, enterprise value or market value of invested capital ratio of 1.7 times versus the EBITDA multiple of 9.9 .9 times. So just kind of a, I wanted to at least provide an exhibit of what it looks like when we're looking at these, uh, you know, a private company transaction. The next page is similar, just, you know, if you get to the point where you need to start measuring based off public companies, well, then there's different ways you can derive you know, these multiples based off the most recent stock closing price, et cetera. And this is something that we don't really use the guideline public company method very often simply because most companies around here, whether a startup or a mature business, are not truly comparable given the, the scope and the reach of a public company um, and different financing options available. So it can be good for a reasonableness check, but by and large, we're not going to use a revenue multiple or a public company multiple all that often. So last but not least uh, is the income approach. So as I said, this is probably the most valuable approach. Um, as compared to the other two, especially if the, the firm is a, you know, generating positive cash flows as of today, or it's expected to generate positive cash flows in the near future. The theory here is the value of a business as of today is equal to the value of the expected future cash flows um, that an investor would receive based off a specific discount rate. So there's two basic approaches within the two basic two basic methods within the income approach. That's a capitalized future economic income, where you're basically going to try to measure the future cash flows based off how you performed over the last, they're called one to five years. Whereas the second one's your discounted future economic income or discounted cash flow method. And you're basically going to try to figure out, okay, what are our cash flows going to be in the future and discount those at a reasonable discount rate back to today. So if I were you know, selling widgets, you know, in the combine, if you wanted to put together a DCF, you, you kind of have to go pretty elementary in terms of, okay, how many items do I, or how many widgets do I expect to sell this year? How many do I expect to sell next year and the year after at what price? 
And then you're going to generally go through the income statement and say, okay, well, what's your fixed expenses based off, um, you know, the overhead that you have to make this amount of widgets. And then what's your variable expenses? So the materials um, and other expenses that, you know, go up in proportion to the, your, uh, your increase in sales. Once you have that, you make some adjustments to cash flow and uh, discount those values back to today. This is just a short snippet of, uh, of what a full DCF looks like. Obviously, they can be a lot more complex, but also more simple. But you know that line down there, the present value of distributable cash flows, you, know, you sum those up. And basically, that's what an investor would be concerned about, is the, the ability to receive distributions into the future in the next five years, as well as the uh, terminal value, which is you know, the years beyond the, the 2025 fiscal year. So that's a lot of information. And I know not, a lot of it may not be relevant as of now, but I would say kind of back to Will's point, you know, thinking through some of these issues and at least being familiar with, you know, how the company will eventually be valued um, is something to keep in mind, you know, whether it's from the base level of, okay, well, how do we reconcile and review our financials and how that translated into value into the future, whether it's a multiple or discounted cash flow analysis. The last thing you want, um, to Will's point, is to have a surprise when you have a transaction coming um, and have it impact the value or, or ultimately blow up the deal. We've seen that plenty of times, and you know, trying to be get ahead of some of those things, you know, when you're first starting out, is is better to uh, get those best practices in place from the beginning, so you don't have those issues uh, in the future. Yeah, my my big takeaway from your portion was. Like you think about some of the numbers founders get thrown, you know, founders come from all walks of life and somebody walks up to you and says, Hey, I want to invest $10 million in your company and say whatever, you know, slap a valuation on it. And all of a sudden you're hearing these big numbers and it's so exciting. Well, uh, it's good to keep in mind that there are kind of ways to do, like you were saying, little sanity checks of like, all right, is this reasonable? Like it might, it might, you know, keeping the right amount. Um, there, there's little sanity checks, like you were saying, to, to you know, maybe the founder's probably not going to get as intricate as, as our m and team does as far as an evaluation, but uh, go to a public company that you think might be somewhat similar and see what that's valued at. Or, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of ways to do a little sanity check just so that you don't get swept off your feet by a big number and yeah. pulled into a relationship you don't like. Yeah. I would say if you get to the point where you've got interest from third party investors, depending on the investor, they may want to go deep into a discounted cash flow analysis and you know, have a lot of data to support some of these high growth, uh, you know, a five times revenue multiple, that's a pretty high growth company. So likely they're going to want to understand the, the future operations of the company to make an investment to uh, kind of support the, the risk appetite that they have. You know? yeah. Michael and Will, that was excellent. I, I will add for, for the people that join live, feel free to toss questions in the chat if you have something that comes oh, yeah. up. I do, I do have a couple of questions I want to ask you guys that I was thinking as you talked about this. On the valuation side, I like one of the bullet points that you said is a sanity check. So my question would be, I feel right now with the super low yield and just the markets of what's, what's acceptable to investors, if there's a hot startup, sometimes the valuation on the venture side, an early stage tech investor, their valuation that a company gets, it seems absolutely like lunacy. And then it's so early and you, know, you, can't, use a, you can't use a multiple because sometimes they're pre-revenue. How do you guys think about the differentiation between a venture investment valuation versus reality? You know, are the companies down the road will actually sell or let alone a, a book value? Um, does that kind of make sense? I mean, sometimes these early stage venture investments, they're so, they're so crazy just because sometimes the investors are just fighting to get in um, that it's, it seems completely out of reality. Yeah, I think you could point at even like the Lucid Air IPO, or the Lucid Electronic Vehicle Maker IPO. That's kind of where it, it doesn't make sense to somebody that's, you know, looking at it from a reality perspective. But if somebody sees that amount of growth, you know, you kind of got to give them the benefit of the doubt. If they're willing to pay, then it is what it is. So we've had a, a few transactions with that on our sell side group and that, you know, 
it's happened to some of our clients that they'll get offered, you know, X times two, and we think it's worth X. And it's like, well, if they want to pay for that, you know, they see something in it. And it's probably oftentimes the same thing with the, what you're saying, Matt, with the pre-revenue companies. If somebody sees something in it, you know, the value is in the eye of the beholders. So if they're going to pay that, then that's worth it to somebody. But it's just, it's hard to reconcile to some degree once you start putting together the, the discounted cash flow and, you know, at least from a textbook, you know, valuation perspective, what some of the inputs have to be, um, you know, to, to support evaluation of that sort. It's, it's mind boggling at times and we end up scratching our heads, but, you know, that's kind of what this world has turned into with the, you know, the amount of excess money we have right now in the yep. economy in general. Exactly. Yeah. And, and on the internal control side, so putting this a little into practice, um, so let's say it's the early founding team, best practices for, for QuickBook users, who has access to what? Because obviously you said, hey, separation and, and, and documentation is, is critical, but I think it would be interesting, best practices for say a founding team of three, but also maybe some of our companies, once they raise some money, they're getting to seven, eight, nine employees. Also, then you want to start be thinking, all right, we don't want everybody to see everything, maybe a more junior employee. We don't want them knowing how much money we have in the bank. Um, we don't have a ton of those companies at the early stage of the combine. And really, post Invest Nebraska, they're starting to dig into those problems. Um, but I think you guys have a unique perspective because you've seen both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, um, I would say as you start growing your team, first thing to think about is like one: does does my new employee need to have any exposure to the accounting and finance part of the company, right? Like if I'm hiring a robotics guy, uh, there's good, there's good chance that that, or, or, or a robotics person, there's good chance that that person doesn't need to be involved with my accounting or finance at all. And in that case, they don't have a role in it. And that's fine because odds are they probably don't want a role in it, right? They're, they want to build stuff and create cool things. And they don't want to have to worry about, you know, if the company's going to, be able to pay their paycheck they just expect to see it so i i guess that's step one is like hey as you're building out your team um and you and you start to build out a team you know separation of duties doesn't have to mean you know everybody involved has some sort of duty in the accounting roles all that means is right like back to my examples of co-founders right if if i have one co-founder that's a has an accounting background and says, all right, I'm going to take the accounting and run with it. And the other co-founder is in some other part of the business. Um, I guess at a small scale, we want to make sure that that co-founder in the other part of the business is still aware of what's going on, right? He's, he or she is a stakeholder still. So they need to know what's going on at a regular basis. Like I said, so that down the road, cash flow problems pop up or something that doesn't run into finger pointing. Now, when you start hiring accounting devoted staff, that's where your accounting staff is there to, uh, you know, categorize, record, and then organize and report all of your transactions. Um, typically, you don't want to have a good rule of thumb is that you don't want to have your accounting staff also be the person that's receiving uh, product, recording that receipt, um, taking the invoice and paying it all through themselves. They might, you know, you might have your robotics person receive the product and say, hey, accounting person, we got 10 widgets. Um, I know you ordered those a month ago, so we got them just to confirm that. And then your accounting person can record that when the invoice comes in, your accounting person records that and then says, hey, Michael, my business owner, we got these widgets, we ordered them, go ahead and I, I wrote out the check why don't you go ahead and sign it so we can send it and pay it? So that's a good example of like a payable cycle that has a good separation of duties between um, the person receiving the goods, recording the receipt of the goods, and then ultimately paying. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good example. Yeah. One other thing that popped into my head is, because um, we run into it a lot, just a great general control. If you're using checks for payments, write them in order that way if a check goes missing and somebody you know somebody tries to do something stupid, like it just makes it so much harder if you're writing your checks in order you know okay check number two comes after check number one well if i see check number one and then check number three get written and check number two's a wall well 
yeah, something might be up. So I need to talk to whoever's handling the checks. That, that's kind of a side tangent because we see it. Companies still screw that up. Uh, so it, it kind of cracks me up, but that's just a, a great practice. But yeah, like I said, um, general rule of thumb, keep the recording and the actual processing of transactions separate. Yeah, yeah. No, very well said. Um, before we close, probably the most important question, uh, how, how can companies get a hold of, of you two both? Best, best ways of contacting the LUTS team. Yeah, I'd say we've got to include our uh, contact information on here, but yeah, we did. I'd say <laughs> uh, I can give you our contact info, Matt, and if you want to give it to anybody, otherwise, you know, we're both on our website, so feel free to reach out, however. And with that being said, you know, we're anxious to have this partnership work for everybody, so you know, we're kind of coming up with these topics on our own, but I hope anybody listening to this call, feel free to reach out to Matt or us or both and just we want your input on what you want us to present on. You know, I don't know when our next presentation will be, maybe a few months from now, but we want to hear from you what is most valuable or what would be most valuable from a presentation standpoint. So keep that in mind. But yeah, otherwise, if anything else pops up, yeah. you know, Will's a great resource for accounting. And then, you know, my group, we handle a lot of just one off things. So we're always happy to talk through issues and just, um, you know, if we can't help, we may be able to point you in the right direction. So yeah. And, and along with that, as you see on that slide down there, Lutz is a, a, you know, the leadership here likes to call it a department of a business services department store, right? So if there's something, as you can see on the bottom there, we have accounting, financial tech, m and and talent. Um, as your team's growing, if you need help with anything, uh, just go to our website too. If you, if, you know, look up either one of us and we can point you in the right direction or go to the website, call the number and somebody can get you pointed in the right direction. Um, so. Yeah. Well, Michael and Will, thank you again for the, the generosity of your time sharing the information. Um, and thank you to everybody watching this after the fact on the YouTube channel and live and the community resources. Um, we hope this is helpful to you. And as Michael very well said, like we'll be in touch with each of you. So we hope that the future presentations and curriculum can be even more honed down and specifically tailored to what we're hoping to provide to you guys. Um, and with that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you again for joining this combined webinar.